Well, as some of as some of you will know, my charts are usually uh, express a reasonably strong point of view, and I was uh, asked. I guess I was really told today to not be opinionated, to be fair and balanced. So you're going to get a lot of on the one hand and on the other hand, which is not my core strength. And it reminds me, it reminds me of a line that Harry Truman was once uh, once uh, said, which was that what he really wanted in life was a one-armed economist. So. Um, <laughs> I'm not even an economist, so you're going to get less than that. But I'm going to try very quickly to put some uh, flesh, uh, some specifics around what David just alluded to, and I'm going to talk really fast because I've got about 20 some odd slides and nine minutes and 21 seconds left to talk about them. Um, so I'm going to try to cover four subjects really quickly: jobs, wages, income inequality, and what we call corporate short-termism. Not everything that David just spoke about, but at least a few of them. So let's start with jobs. Uh, as everybody knows, I think the overall employment picture has been quite strong. We've had 70-some-odd straight months of job increases, averaging about 200,000 jobs a month for the past year. And as part of that, our unemployment rate, which got up to 10 percent at the peak of the recession, is now at 4.7 percent, which is most economists would consider to be at or very, very close to so-called full employment. So that's all good news. What's less good news is that participation in the labor force, and that is people over 16 years old choosing to say, I'm looking for work, or they have a job, has been declining really since the recession, uh, since really since 2007 or 2008. It peaked back in 1970, uh, I'm sorry, it is as low as, low it is, sorry, it is lower than it has been since 1977. And there are really three reasons that most people ascribe to it. One is demographics, that we are an aging society, and that's about half of the total effect. Another is the effect of the recession, which drives people out of the labor force. And as you can see, the pink bars have been getting larger and the green bars have been getting, uh, sections have been getting smaller as the two change. And then there's a hunk that the that economists basically say, we don't really know what's going on here, but it's obviously not particularly good news. And what's also not good news is when you compare this to other countries. So this goes back to 1990, and it compares uh, all the OECD countries, about 24 countries, I think, to each other. And you can see that we are the third ones from the left. If you can read that out there, I can sort of see it here. Third ones from the left, and we're kind of right in the middle of the pack. And this is simply what they call prime age males, males 25 to 54 who are at the peak of their uh, careers. And you can see at that point we were in the low 90% range, right in, as I said, amongst our competitors. But here's what's happened since then. Uh, while participation has dropped in some other countries, it's actually dropped more in the US. And we are now the third lowest of all of these countries in this percent of prime age males. So we're lower than all the European countries. We're lower than pretty much everybody. And the picture isn't really any better if you look at women. We actually have today about the same uh, labor force participation among prime age women as Japan, and we don't think of Japan as exactly a bastion of female empowerment. So there's something obviously going on. So if you look at who's dropping out, it really is mostly the less educated. And again, we're focused here on prime age males. And so you can see that since 1964, their participation, which was pushing 98%, has really dropped only slightly to about 94%. If you look at people who have some amount of college, it's dropped by more, it's down to 88%. And if you look at people who have high school or less, it's down to 83%. So what that obviously means is that 17% of males between 25 to 54 with a high school education or less are not even looking for a job. They're not in the labor force today. And uh, David mentioned some of the social issues, which I'm really not going to get into here, but you can easily imagine the impact on drug use and, and family structure and a whole bunch of other things. Let's talk for a second about the gig economy, which has gotten a lot, of, uh, a lot of attention. It has obviously grown very fast. This simply addresses people who have gotten uh, jobs through or working as part of online services like Uber or Airbnb or TaskRabbit or eBay. And you can see that a few years ago it was effectively nobody. It's now up, but it's only really up to 1% of the labor force, about evenly uh, divided between uh, firms that are considered to be labor, users of labor, like Uber, where you're driving, and firms that are considered to be users of capital, like Airbnb, where you have an asset that you're putting to work. And what's interesting is that, in con in the, put that in context, you can see that the number of people who are self-employed as a percent of the labor force has actually been dropping during these, this period. 
And so it is a little hard at this moment, uh, as much as the gig economy is in the news, to see that this has, so far anyway, transformed uh, our labor force. Let me turn to wages. David talked about uh, the situation with wages. So first, just as a basic, as everybody probably knows, wages are supposed to track productivity. The more you produce, the more you get. And until about 1973, that essentially was happening. But since 1973, there's been a huge disconnect between productivity and wages. And people's incomes are simply not going up as they have produced more. Now, most recently, there is some evidence that wages have begun to rise. This is median family incomes, and as you can, adjusted for inflation. And as you can see, they really, from 2000 till 2008, they essentially didn't move. Then they plummeted, and they've been gradually rising a little bit. But what's interesting, and just again to give you both sides of the picture, is that in the last year and a half or so, there's actually been a pretty substantial increase in median uh, average wages. And this is something that one would expect to happen as the economy gets stronger, but we've not seen a lot of evidence. Now, to be fair, their wage data is very confusing. I'm not going to explain these different measures, but there are many measures of wages, some of which show less uh, improvement, some of which show a little bit more improvement, some of which show still more improvement. Uh, and so you can take all this for what you will, but it does appear that at the moment, wages are just starting to rise ever so slowly. Now, at the same time, corporate profits are near a record. Uh, in terms of these, this shows corporate profit margins, but if you looked at it in dollars, you'd see the same thing. So you've basically got corporations doing very well, workers not doing so well, even if they might be doing a little bit better at the moment. And so why is that? I'm not going to get into these different reasons, but this is the checklist I'm sure the next two panels will, globalization, technology, tax policy, declining unionization, and what we call winner-take-all labor markets. Um, no presentation like this would be complete without saying a word about income inequality. Um, this looks at something called the Gini coefficient, in which zero is perfect equality and one is perfect inequality. And so again, if you go back to 1985, you can see that among this group of countries, we did have the highest Gini coefficient, we did have the highest level of income inequality. But what's happened since then is that our level of income inequality has risen faster than pretty much all of them. And so we now very much stand out in the pack. Um, another way to think about this or this problem is what does a, a country do to help those who are uh, behind? And so if you look at income before government gets involved, before taxes, before social programs, we're actually in the mix somewhere. And you can see that we're not even the most unequal country in terms of pre-government transfer, pre-social program um, uh, income inequality. But if you then look at what we do, we actually do less as a government to redistribute, I know that's a sometimes ugly word, but to redistribute income to those less fortunate, and that puts us very much at the top of the pack. And then my last uh, subject is the, is the question of, are companies short, too short-term? Are they managing too much for quarterly earnings? Are they, are they not investing uh, for the future? And I think here the, uh, there's some interesting evidence that I want to show you all. So first, if you look at companies, what they do with their excess cash, since 2009, the amount of money they've spent on, the annual amount of money they've spent on share repurchase has essentially tripled. And this has gotten a fair amount of attention. The amount of money that they devote to dividends has gone up by two thirds, also gotten a fair amount of attention. The amount of money that's gone to investment has only risen by 41%, which is why you hear a fair amount about, one of the reasons why anyway, you hear a fair amount about corporate short termism. But, Business spending is actually somewhat better than perception. And again, this goes all the way back to 1970. It looks as bu at business spending as a percent of GDP. And so if you look at equipment, you can see that the line has trended down a bit over that period of time, and there are reasons for it that, again, I'm not going to have time to get into. If you look at uh, structures, and I, we've taken energy out of this because it's very volatile, you can also see it's trended down a little bit over that period of time. If you look at spending on intellectual property, which is things like software, that's not surprisingly gone up a lot. And so when you put them all together, you actually see total business spending outside of energy as a percent of GDP essentially oscillating within a band. Now, I would say quickly that in these last couple of quarters, there's been a, good, a bit more uh, investment weakness, which I think has a variety of explanations. But if you take a somewhat longer view, it's hard to see that business here has just is simply stopped investing. And similarly, if you look at business spending on R&D, it is essentially at a record high, again, as a percent of GDP. Companies are spending more and more on business investment. And then lastly, the question of, does the stock market reward companies that choose to invest rather than create more short-term profits? 
And what this chart shows is that companies that invest the highest percentage of their revenues in research and development actually have had the fastest growth in the stock market. Not entirely surprising because of the tech industry, but what is interesting for those who think that the stock market simply doesn't reward long-term performance is think about companies like Amazon, which essentially has made almost no profit in its history, has a $400 billion, because, because Jeff Bezos is so committed to investing, has a $400 billion market capitalization today, or Google, which is now actually called Alphabet, uh, similar but less, slightly less traumatic story. It's very hard to, make the, to me to make the argument that the stock market is incapable of rewarding companies that choose to invest. And with that, I am 33 seconds over, and I thank you very much for listening.